tonight we have a real treat because our speaker is residing in the Northwest Territories. And not only that, he's a fellow Hamiltonian. Kevin was born in Hamilton, Ontario and raised in Southern Ontario. He graduated from the University of Waterloo with a bachelor's in environmental studies and a master's in planning. His graduate studies took him to the Yukon where he fell in love with the North and, have, and he uh, moved to Yellowknife in 1985 where he got married. Now I assume he fell in love with a young lady in uh, the Yukon or Northwest Territories as well. Um, he has two adult children he has worked for a variety of Aboriginal, federal, and territorial government agencies and non-governmental organizations on environmental issues and resource management. He serves as a member of the Legislative Assembly for the Northwest Territories for the Frame Lake Riding in Yellowknife since uh, 2015. Kevin began, began collecting stamps to the world at five years of age, then Canada, then the centennial issue, and finally postal history of the Northwest Territories, starting in 1972. He is best known for his philatelic writing on Northern postal history and has exhibited widely on the topic. He serves as the director of the Postal History Society of Canada, and he is on the Gelder Award Committee for the uh, RPSC. His other philatelic services includes six years with the Canada Post Stamp Advisory Committee. Kevin currently collects Northwest Territories, Yukon and Labrador postal history with a few other sidelines, including USAPOs in Canada and Newfoundland. Now Kevin's presentation tonight is a friendly invasion by US forces in, Ch in Churchill, Manitoba. So Kevin, take it away. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Ken, and thanks uh, to the uh, Society for the Invitation. First time I've uh, met as part of the Society, but I know a lot of you, I've corresponded with you over the years, and met uh, many of you at stamp shows and so on. And uh, as a younger flatist, I used to go and visit Gray a lot in Toronto as well. So. Um, great to see you all, and thanks very much for, uh, again for the invitation. And my apologies, I know that I was scheduled a couple of other times to uh, present and had to uh, uh, dash out at the last minute once uh, with the uh, life of a politician. Sometimes things kind of come up at the last minute. I think the last time I had a private member's bill and we had a public hearing that was scheduled at the last minute the same night as a presentation. So. Uh, anyways, thanks very much for the patience, and I'll try to get on with the, the presentation. Um, and I, I just want to say that um, politicians don't know how to use Zoom, <laughs> so uh, don't don't feel that uh, it's just flatless. It's uh, politicians are probably even worse. We we can't even get uh, there's a couple of uh, my MLAs that won't even use a computer, so it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Maybe my my first question is: Has anybody on this call actually ever been uh, to Churchill? Just yell it out. Yes. Never. Oh, okay. That's that's great. It's more than more than I expected. Oh, so, yeah. All right. Well, so, if, I kill yeah, you probably saw it went up for polar bears or whatever. So that's that's great. Uh, um, anyway, so my talk tonight is about the U.S. forces uh, at uh, Churchill and. Uh, and so here's an outline, and I, I'm going to try to keep this to about 20, 25 minutes, so there's some time for questions, obviously. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of an introduction, some of the historical background on Churchill, talk about something called the Crimson Project. We'll give you some highlights of U.S. military activity at Churchill. Then, of course, I'm going to move into uh, some discussion of postal services. And uh, the Americans actually had their own post offices, Army post offices associated uh, with their activities in Churchill. And I'll talk something or a little bit about censorship and then how the site was reused afterwards uh, by uh, other um, military operations and the Canadian military. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about some future uh, research uh, uh, opportunities. So 
So uh, why Churchill? Um, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company set it up as a, uh, a post and actually built a, a large stone fort that some of you may have visited there. And uh, back then, the mail service was uh, once a year, uh, uh, or at least during the shipping season when uh, mail would come over and, and supply ships. There was an inland service that uh, Churchill wasn't one of the major forts, but uh, York Factory, which is fairly close, was one of the main uh, uh, forts. And there was often inland uh, service uh, from, from these uh, sort of uh, coastal uh, forts or trading posts. Um, but uh, why Churchill? Well, in 1912, um, there was a, a railway that was started from the, uh, you know, the uh, the Great Plains, so the, the interior, the prairies of Canada, out to Hudson Bay is another alternative to uh, get grain out of uh, Western Canada. So that uh, railway was started in 1912. And it wasn't, they were actually going to build it up to a place called Port Nelson, but shifted it uh, in the late 1920s to towards Churchill, which was a better port. And uh, it was finally completed in 1929. And uh, a Canadian post office opened up at Churchill in 1932. And the service was basically by uh, train once a week. So here's some examples of uh, mail around the time that the railway was actually finished. The uh, top uh, left cover with the Hudson's Bay Company flag on it is uh, from a post office called Amory, which was kind of at the end of steel for a while. And I believe this cover came down from one of the Hudson Bay Company posts at either Churchill or York Factory. That's the only cover reported from Amory. It was only open for a short period of time. You can see there on the screen. Uh, the cover below that was from a uh, telegraph uh, crew that was working along the, the railway as well. And then the cover on the right-hand side of the screen is from the Anglican Mission at uh, what was at that time called Eskimo Point. It's now called Arviat, and it's in Nunavut. Uh, and so it was carried by dog team down to uh, uh, Churchill and then put into the mail uh, uh, along the railway and uh, eventually reached the Paw and then down to over to Calgary. So these are just to show you some examples of mail from around the period when the, the uh, railway was uh, completed. Uh, and that's why Churchill uh, is an important uh, place and featured in my presentation. So let's turn to the why the military came to uh, Churchill and the Americans in particular. So we know the, Euro, the and during, during the World War II, the operations were largely in the European theater for the first while. And uh, there needed to be supply, secure supply routes to get people uh, and material to and from Europe. And the Americans came up with the idea of something called the North Atlantic Ferry Route. And uh, there were several sort of routes that were uh, proposed. Not all of them were uh, necessarily completed, but there was a, a big airfield at Goose Bay that you've probably heard about. And there was one at Frobisher Bay uh, in uh, Nunavut uh, on Baffin Island. And uh, there was a, 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 another route that sort of came further to the west uh, and uh, it started in uh, the U.S., then Regina, uh, the Paw, Churchill, Southampton Island, and met up uh, with uh, another leg that uh, came up uh, through central uh, Quebec and um, to Frobisher Bay. And then, of course, over through Greenland and Iceland to Prestwick, Scotland, and then they could go on from there. So um, that's why uh, Churchill became one of these uh, airfields. And... Uh, with railway access, it was also used as a supply point to build some of the other airfields uh, like Southampton Island. Um, and uh, materials were also carried over to uh, uh, Fort Chimo and uh, um, Frobisher Bay as well. And they also came up uh, around through uh, Montreal. But So there you get a sort of sense of why uh, Churchill was important and its, its role in all of this. So this is a, a quick chronology of uh, American activities in military activities at Churchill. So July 15th, there was a, a bunch of uh, soldiers that arrived in Churchill on the train, much to the surprise of locals, really didn't know. And then they uh, 
sort of installed a pass system in the community, which wasn't always very well received, but eventually they worked out arrangements with the locals and so on. Uh, but there was as many as uh, like about 2,200, 2,500 American personnel that came up and uh, they arrived on the train. They set up their first camp in the sort of the downtown area of Churchill, such that it was. And then their real task, though, was to complete a, an airfield, which was about five miles uh, southeast of the town. Uh, and it was not the, it's, I think it's fair to say that there wasn't a lot of air traffic. Uh, the Americans were very gr good at planning, having great plans, but uh, uh, they overbuilt a lot of the facilities and so on uh, in Canada. And this was one of the examples. So there wasn't a lot of air traffic. Uh, eventually, the air base was turned back to Canada in 1945, and then it became a, um, a Canadian military facility and uh, was associated with something called Exercise Muskox, which was an overland uh, expedition from Churchill that actually went through the Arctic and ended up back in Edmonton, believe it or not, overland with uh, military vehicles and uh, airdrops and so on. So when the Canadians took it over, uh, they renamed the uh, air base uh, sort of facility for Churchill. There was a, a military post office there as well. Uh, the Americans continued to use some of the facilities for testing and training. Um, the Americans uh, last used the area in Churchill for a strategic air command refueling air base uh, uh, for B-52 bombers that carried nuclear weapons as well. Uh, and even the Canadian military left Churchill in 1980, and most of the site was demolished uh, quickly afterwards. So the air photo on the um, uh, left-hand side, you can see if you can, <laughs> sorry, it's a little bit small, but the, the port of Churchill is kind of uh, just uh, at the tip of the, the uh, peninsula uh, uh, in the middle of the, the uh, air photo. The railway, you can see that line going up to the port. The, the town center, such that it was, was uh, just uh, a little bit uh, um, to the, uh, I guess, uh, right of the, the port. And then the airfield you see at the uh, uh, sort of uh, bottom uh, right-hand side of the photo, they had two airstrips and a bunch of buildings and things that they, they built as part of the airfield. So the... Um, U.S. Army post offices started off in the in the uh, uh, downtown area, such that it was, and uh, the, there was a couple of short-lived ones that were located there, and then they opened up a, a third one at the air base itself, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The photograph is of the civilian uh, Canadian post office, uh, and 1943, which was sort of in that that downtown area of uh, Churchill. And we're gonna see some mail that was uh, from the Americans that were, was put through the uh, civilian post office as well. I just wanna talk a little bit now about the beginning of the, the postal service when the Americans arrived. And this cover is what really got me kind of uh, uh, started on all of this. And I, I got it, I don't know, probably 20, 25 years ago in an auction. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. What I did know was that the registration box, there's handwritten in there, it says the PAW. And then there's a number above it, 5142. And, uh, and then there's a, a Saskatoon uh, District emergency uh, hammer just to uh, uh, center uh, uh, left. And um, it's dated September 7th, 1942. So I wanted to know what the heck is this cover all about? Uh, I did recognize the number 5142, which is a moon number or money order office number for those that collect Canadian postal history. And I figured out that that's actually the, the post office in Churchill. So uh, what is this American guy doing in, uh, or sorry, somewhere? And it's mailed in the paw, but it's got this funny looking uh, moon number in here. What is going on with this cover? So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but the Americans, before their post offices opened, and even afterwards, they were sending stuff through the the uh, Canadian civilian post office in Churchill. And of course, they wanted to have some secrecy and uh, um, control of what people were, the soldiers were saying and so on. So uh, the uh, Canadian post office was asked if they could find some way to 
uh, provide for uh, some measure of control of the even the American military mail that was going out. And so the Canadian Post Office brought up uh, an emergency uh, hammer from the Saskatoon district and started to use that to cancel some of the mail. I've no, only ever seen it used on this cover, which is a registered item. And they, but they used the obliterators uh, as, a, as an additional kind of security measure. And they must have had a cutout registration box, uh, as you can see here, and they would put the, the office number maybe on just the registered mail to better track or identify that it was coming from Churchill somehow. Um, and you'll see in the lower left uh, corner of the cover, there's a censored marking and kind of blue green that's upside down. Uh, and then a quarter master core uh, captain, I believe, has censored the item as well. So um, I went and looked at some of the records in the uh, National Archives and had some help from Tom Hillman, who was an archivist there. And uh, lo and behold, I, I was able to find out that, yes, so the Canadian uh, post office was handling this military mail and using these obliterators as a, as a censorship measure. So a very unusual kind of arrangement. And uh, that's what kind of got me going on this topic. So uh, there's the, on the left, uh, sorry, right-hand side of the screen are the postal markings of that area that were used at Churchill. Some proof strikes there. So you can see they had a circle date stamp, a uh, crown seal that was used in as a, a seal, a, a wax impression, uh, I think likely for um, uh, important uh, mail uh, um, on uh, mailbag tags, that kind of thing, registration box, a rubber circular dater, and a uh, what we call a moto cancel money order town office, and then the straight line number. Uh, that you see there. And then the Saskatoon District uh, Emergency Hammer, there's a proof strike of it at uh, lower left uh, or lower right as well. So those, those um, were in use at the time the Americans arrived, but they switched to this uh, sort of system of using the emergency uh, hammers and the obliterators to try to conceal where the mail was coming from and uh, provide some measure of uh, censorship uh, as well. So, so the Americans did eventually get their own post office, uh, but it took quite a while for the date stamps to arrive. And so uh, the, the first items that were mailed were basically mail address only. And some of them were like uh, put in closed bags and then uh, put on the train and carried out and eventually went into the American uh, mail stream in Chicago. You'll see a couple of these items have Chicago machine cancels on them. And uh, so that's where they would enter the American mail stream. So there was kind of like a closed bag system out of uh, the out of the Churchill uh, post office or uh, the their own units would bag up the mail and bring it over. And of course, these were uh, soldiers so they could send their mail for free. And there was two post offices located in the the, uh, the Churchill town site area, APO 66 zero and 669. They were associated with a couple of different units that were stationed there. I don't know why they had two post offices, but uh, so here's some examples uh, through um, uh, that were sent free and are censored and uh, but didn't actually get into the mail until they uh, uh, arrived in uh, Chicago. So uh, here's a couple more with return addresses of APO 660. So these were uh, actually mailed though through the, the Canadian post office at Churchill, Canadian postage uh, being paid, top item uh, airmail. And because it was airmail, it was not sent free. So it had to be prepaid by postage. The bottom item uh, is prob was probably from a civilian. Uh, so they had to pay the postage, uh, but uh, um, you know, you'll see the, the use of the obliterators and on the, the bottom cover, there's the uh, Chicago uh, transit uh, date stamp as well. And both of them have American civilian um, censorship tapes that were uh, put on when the items arrived in uh, Chicago. But another example of mail through that has a return address of APO 660, but was sent through the Canadian post office because the American APO had not yet uh, received their date stamps. So here's uh, some examples of covers now actually mailed through the APO 660 after the date stamps were received. Uh, and uh, so the post office uh, finally opened on September 28th, 1942. 
uh, and was only open until November the 6th. So it's really hard to find the state stamp used. Uh, and um, yeah, what else can I add here? A couple of items, uh, they're censored. Uh, one that has a, a US stamp that wasn't necessarily required, but uh, could have been sent free. But, um, and then an official, uh, the long number 10 item is an official cover. So uh, it uh, didn't require any censorship, but uh, yeah. And the, the numbers did not appear in the date stamps. Uh, you'll see some uh, APO covers later that actually has the APO number in the, the, uh, the dial uh, or in the indicia in the middle. Uh, uh, but for the first while, uh, you'll see there that they were not including the numbers and the APO cancels as a, a security uh, measure. A couple of incoming uh, items uh, to APO 660 to soldiers that were in Churchill. The same, uh, this, actually, it's the same soldier here, but um, the Canadian post office handled some of the incoming mail for a while. And eventually it was kind of uh, just taken in bags and given to the uh, the uh, each of the units uh, and uh, orderly rooms, and then they would distribute the, the mail themselves, but quite unusual to see uh, incoming mail that was actually saved. So here's the other uh, American APO 669. Here's a couple of free uh, covers that uh, were mailed by soldiers uh, and uh, no postal markings whatsoever on them. Uh, they were obviously censored, uh, but uh, and they were carried through the mail, but nothing on the back. So. Uh, the way you, you find these is by the, the APO number and looking hard on eBay and dealer stock. So, so here's a, a, another couple of covers from APO 669, but these ones were mailed through the Canadian post office before 669 actually had uh, its own date stamps. Or in some cases, there might've been a preference to just mail stuff through the Canadian post office to try to avoid uh, uh, security or whatever, but uh, these two items uh, were, were censored in any event. They have the Canadian postage because because they were paid uh, for the airmail rate, but you see the obliterator used there and uh, no other can Canadian postal marking. The, uh, the, dis the Saskatoon District Emergency Hammer was not used, as far as I can tell, on uh, regular uh, uh, airmail or um, just regular mail. Uh, but, uh, and as I say in the notes below there, uh, even though after the, the, the uh, APO opened, the records that I've seen indicate that 40% of the U.S. personnel still preferred to just use the Canadian post office. Not sure why, but uh, maybe it was more convenient, cheaper, I don't know. So here's the only four uh, covers I've ever seen with the APO 669 uh, date stamp. And uh, it uh, finally arrived uh, around September the 28th. And that's when the post office opened and it closed on November the 7th. So a very sh short window for uh, uh, its use and trying to find these items. Um, all of these covers were censored, of course. And the one cover on the lower right has a return address of APO 737, which was the APO that opened up at the airfield afterwards. But this date stamp uh, is still uh, the uh, APO 6691. And this, uh, I guess, soldier just wanted to get the right address in there in anticipation of the, uh, the new uh, post office opening up out at the airfield. So here's uh, a couple of early covers from APO 737, which was at the airfield. The uh, top uh, um, one on the left side has uh, um, an unusual double circle uh, date stamp. It's a bit incomplete on the top side, but those were generally used on receipts and uh, registered mail on the back of the covers. So kind of unusual to see it on the front of a cover, but uh, um, maybe they didn't get the one with the killer, uh, the dome cancels, I guess, as the, as the Americans call them uh, right away. Uh, so they started to use the other one first, but uh, um, those, those are pretty hard to find. And then the one on the right is the earliest strike I've seen of the, uh, you know, the, the one with the uh, bar uh, duplex style, as the Canadians would call it. Um, um, yeah, that's probably all I need to say about that slide. So here's a couple of covers uh, with the return addresses of APO 737, uh, but again, mailed through the Canadian post office because they have Canadian postage and the obliterators 
uh, uh, you, the obliterator used as, as sort of like a censorship um, measure. And the bottom cover uh, actually has a Chicago transit marking, which so you can date this one. And that's the last, the latest cover I've ever seen uh, with uh, from the American forces at Churchill through the Canadian post office with a, the obliterator. I've never seen one mailed by the American military that actually has a Churchill circle date stamp on it. So uh, whoever was at the post office was very, very careful in uh, how they, they treated all of the mails. So uh, here's a couple more covers from APO 737 out at the airfield uh, at Churchill. The one on the left uh, does not have a number uh, in the indicia or anywhere around the dial. Uh, the one on the right actually does. And you'll see it at the top, it's just above May and it says 737. So it was a, a you know some uh, numbers that were inserted in the indicia in the center of the the the, uh, the dater, um, and so the one on the left is the latest without the number. The one on the right is the earliest I've seen uh, with the the number in it. Um, and uh, there's some dates about the usage of numbers uh, in the the text below. Yeah. So here's a uh, um, a couple of items with that scarce double ring cancel that I mentioned. Uh, the one on the uh, left uh, uh, has the parent office as New York, New York. And um, so that was kind of for accounting purposes and administrative purposes, the APOs would report uh, back to a parent office. And for a while it was uh, New York and then it switched to Minneapolis. So um, the one on the uh, uh, left has uh, New York facing slip. The one on the right is the back of a registered cover that was mailed through APO 693 at um, Southampton Island, but has a transit marking through 737 at Churchill. And so you, it has Minneapolis. And it's the, the one that's in, in the, the top part of the cover, uh, top center, just a little bit to the, the right. So those are really hard uh, cancels to find, uh, but it shows the how the, the uh, the post office switched uh, parent offices uh, as well. So this was the, the last cover that I've seen from uh, the latest cover from 737 is the one on the lower uh, left hand side. Uh, the post office uh, uh, closed up on uh, July 29th and the, Ameri the Americans more or less left and turned the site over to Canada on August the 1st. Um, the cover uh, on the right-hand side is from uh, uh, Ian Morgan, a famous Canadian military philatelist, trying to, I guess, send some covers up to a a APO 737. Unfortunately, they didn't get there until after the post office closed, but there's a, a bit cut down cover addressed to APO 737, uh, so after it closed. So there was, the Americans used, uh, what they called temporary uh, APOs or army post offices. Uh, and they had uh, four digit numbers, some cases a five digit number. And these were kind of like temporary mailing addresses only for the most part that were used and attached to um, usually uh, units moving around or shipments of material and uh, personnel going from one place to another. And some of these temporary APOs were actually associated with uh, American military activities at Churchill. And here's three examples here. Um, there's the, the postcard at left is actually is canceled at APO 660, but as a, an APO 3121, if I can read that correctly. And then the one in the middle is another temporary APO using that uh, harder to find double ring cancel. And finally, the one on the right is, uh, is a return address um, and a sensor marking for the APO that uh, was located at Frobisher Bay, but it was mailed through Churchill. So I think it must have been flown out uh, and uh, put into the mail at uh, Churchill. Unusual use of um, officially sealed labels, I think for censorship uh, purposes when the, the cover was slid open and. Uh, the contents were probably examined and then uh, closed with the uh, officially sealed labels. So, so anyways, uh, those were the only ones that I've ever seen from these temporary APOs, but you can't find them uh, when you, you uh, uh, I've been collecting this stuff for about 30, 35 years 
now and they, they are hard to find. So here's a, a slide that shows some of uh, the uh, censorship markings you can come across. Uh, I call these provisional markings because they were um, ones that were especially manufactured by um, uh, you know, the units or uh, individuals and uh, they weren't kind of like standard issue and you see the names of uh, um, you know, uh, officers that, that would censor the mail in some of these. Um, and uh, there's a great book by Richard Halbach about some of these uh, provisional markings and ones that were also used in 1942, uh, if you ever want to uh, uh, find out more about these. So these are the, the standard uh, issue censorship markings that you, you tend to find on APO covers. Uh, you find these base sensors, the circle ones at the top, those are the ones that I've seen from used uh, from the APOs in Churchill. Uh, 737. And then the bottom ones are what we are called racetracks uh, numbers. And they each one has a different number in there. And sometimes they seem to either be attached to individual sensor people that would censor the mail or to units. Um, there's probably some more work that could be done there. But those are the ones that I've uh, found uh, uh, just another way to kind of collect different uh, material from, from this, the American military activity. Uh, you can even find uh, some Navy uh, sensor markings on uh, American military mail through APOs, uh, APO 737 in particular, because it was open for a longer period of time. And because Churchill was a port, um, you know, I guess the, uh, the Navy did, uh, U.S. Navy uh, and uh, commercial uh, uh, shipping did supply some of these other air bases that were under development. So you can find some naval mail uh, with naval sensor markings that were was mailed through the uh, US uh, APO system at Churchill as well. So now we're, you know, the after the Americans kind of built the base and left, they turned it over to the Canadians and the Canadians used it for um, uh, basically some um, exercises and testing of equipment and uh, uh, cold weather uh, operations. And the, the first big one that was operated out of Churchill was something called Exercise Muskox. And it was a, an overland expedition. And you'll see the postcard at lower uh, left there. There's these, um, uh, I'm not going to remember the names. I should remember these things. Bombardiers uh, that were uh, used to, to carry people and personnel like and supplies overland from Churchill uh, up the, the coast for a while, up to a place called Cambridge Bay in the Arctic, and then uh, eventually did back down to Edmonton. It was a huge uh, uh, effort and uh, uh, sort of waving the flag for Canadian sovereignty and so on. Um, and there was a, a special post office set up through uh, the Canadian Postal Corps, and there's a postcard uh, mailed through that, uh, through that exercise. And uh, there were some Americans that were part of this as well. And the cover uh, on the top uh, right-hand side is from the, signed by the uh, um, uh, senior US military observer on the, uh, uh, on exercise uh, muskox. So uh, just a, another connection with the US military at uh, Churchill. So e even after the Canadians took over the facilities, the Americans, as I said, continued to, uh, uh, have personnel there for testing and so on. And, and here's some um, covers from that uh, era. Um, the uh, Canada set up a, a military post office 1015 uh, at the uh, airfield in Churchill. They changed the name of it to Fort Churchill and um, uh, eventually it closed in 1975. And I think I mentioned earlier how the Canadians uh, Canadian military left Churchill in 1980 as well, but here's some covers that were from Americans that were obviously stationed at Churchill, but mailed through the uh, 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 Fort Churchill post office. Um, uh, just uh, another illustration of some of the Canadian or U.S. military activities at Churchill. And so I, I mentioned the, uh, at the beginning that the last sort of American presence was a, a strategic uh, air command. Uh, they had a refueling base. Uh, at uh, Fort Churchill, and here's a, a cover from that uh, unit, and uh, it's got a, a nice uh, U.S. Army uh, test center uh, meter on it uh, um, and as kind of one of the, I think that's the last item in my uh, one framer that, that'll be at uh, CAPEX. And so here's some 
uh, ideas and things for some future research that uh, I kind of follow up when and where I can. But uh, I think that there's we can probably find some new dates and cancel types, new sensor markings. Uh, I did write a, a, an article about this in the American Philatelic Congress book back in 1999. And I was invited to write a, an article by the editor of La Posta, uh, a U.S. Uh, postal history uh, journal. And I finished that over the holidays. So it'll I'm hoping it comes out early in, in this year and I can uh, put that on my uh, um, synopsis page. But I, And I was basically reporting some of the new stuff that I had found since that article back in 1999. But uh, I haven't yet found any military, U.S. military records related to these post offices, but I'm sure there are some at the uh, U.S. National Archives in Washington. I'd love to go there and dig out some stuff. But uh, um, I think there's probably um, some double cir circle markings that it may exist from these two early US APOs. I, I think they'd be very tough to find, but there might be some out there. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that there's other examples of US military mail uh, out there. Uh, and I have some other material from some of the other US APOs, another one of my sidelines, uh, and some stuff that probably transited through uh, Churchill as well. And thankfully, the end. Uh, uh, so there you've got my contact information. If you've got any of these APO covers socked away, I'd love to hear from you and uh, happy to try to answer any uh, questions that you may have. And uh, once again, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all today and uh, do my, uh, my uh, presentation. Thanks. Mm -hmm.